Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a, uh, a, a real honor and pleasure to be uh, involved in a conference with so many distinguished scholars. Uh, I likewise would like to thank the organizers of this conference at uh, the Center for Constitutional Studies. Uh, uh, you have all outdone yourself in bringing together uh, splendid representatives of different points of view uh, with regard to Justice Scalia and, and originalism and bringing together people who, as they express these points of view, can do so so civilly and with uh, such uh, good grace. Um, I'm talking about Scalia's uh, originalist approach to constitutional interpretation. And uh, just a couple of statistics. Uh, Professor uh, 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 Straub um, pointed out first that uh, he gave some statistics in one of his PowerPoints. But, uh, I have been asked to update my book on, on Justice Scalia that came out in 2006. Uh, in a new paperback edition, there's going to be an afterword uh, in which I was asked to sort of bring up to date his major opinions in the 10 years since the book's publication. And I touch on about 40, uh, 40 cases in what turned out to be a fairly lengthy afterward, uh, 26,000 words long. But uh, I, I researched, uh, as I was doing that, uh, the total number of opinions Scalia has ever written. Uh, he wrote 808 opinions in just short of 30 years. That's averaging close to 27 opinions a year. Uh, that's well above average for uh, his, his colleagues. 273 of those were majority opinions. 20 were opinions announcing the judgment of the court. 229 were opinions uh, concurring in the judgment, 84 were concurring opinions, 202 were dissenting opinions. We, have, uh, we had these two uh, uh, unabashedly self-identified originalists on the court, Scalia and Thomas. They served together just short of 25 years on the court. Um, right now, 25 years ago, Sc uh, Thomas was undergoing Senate confirmation. Um, in uh, those uh, close to 25 years together on the court, they joined together in, they, they heard together 1,957 cases, and they joined opinions together with each other 1,659 times for an 84.8% agreement rate. Although, as uh, uh, Jack was pointing out, they don't always agree. And uh, 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 one, one good example would be uh, the, the case mentioned, Brown against uh, Entertainment Merchants Association. Another was a case on his last full year on the court, Navarrete against California, uh, where uh, he dismisses uh, Thomas's uh, argument that stopping a vehicle based simply on uh, an anonymous phone call that this person was driving recklessly and might be drunk, uh, that there was probable cause to pull over the, uh, the individual in that case. Thomas wrote that that was the case, and Scalia wrote, don't you believe it? Um, okay, so one year after Scalia came on the court, uh, only 7% of all briefs filed before the Supreme Court made an originalist argument. 20 years later, that number had jumped to 35%. And that was no accident. Scalia arrived at the Supreme Court when the justices were uh, generally results-oriented, embracing some notion of a living constitution namely the belief that the Constitution is essentially an empty vessel into which they can pour whatever meaning they wished. And they saw the Constitution as having no necessarily permanent or fixed meaning, but rather was a living, evolving document that must be interpreted to conform to the times. And uh, Scalia's argument was, no, the times must be made to conform to the Constitution. And uh, he pulled initially single-handedly and uh, later in tandem with uh, Justice Thomas, the court in a more originalist direction. And he did so by pursuing what I'm going to call his original public meaning approach. Uh, he insisted that the text of the Constitution should be construed consistent with the original understanding of those who drafted and ratified it. That meant for him consulting dictionaries of the era and other founding era documents, but not to find out why certain uh, arrangements were, uh, what they were to accomplish and why they were important, but more to simply ascertain what the words and phrases of the Constitution meant to the society uh, that adopted it. Uh, for Scalia, uh, 
reliance on, on the text and tradition of, of the Constitution was a means of constraining judicial discretion. We have this great passage uh, that was uh, quoted, I believe, at lunch. The judge who always likes the results he reaches is a bad judge. I guess my question uh, for Elizabeth would be, uh, uh, how often do, original, uh, do progressive judges use progressive originalism to reach a, a conclusion contrary to their policy preferences? Uh, I, I, I think what I'm, I want to point out as we proceed is how often Scalia did exactly that. Uh, and that's something I would fault to some degree Justice Alito uh, for, for doing. Alito seems uh, to, uh, he has a conservative orientation and he will find precedent to support whatever con uh, con conservative conclusion he, he wishes. Uh, that's not often the case with, uh, uh, with Scalia. Um, Scalia argued that faithful adherence to the text or if uh, that textual provision is ambiguous on the traditional understanding of that text, uh, reduces the danger that judges will substitute their beliefs for societies. Jack made a comment about how, uh, how important tradition is for, for Scalia. And uh, in Shad Against Arizona in 1991, Scalia wrote, when judges test their notions of fairness against an American tradition that is deep and broad and continuing, it is not the tradition that is on trial, but the judges. Um, in, a, uh, in his dissent in the United States against Virginia, uh, that was the case in 1996 in which the court proclaimed that the exclusively male-only admission policy of, uh, of Virginia Military Institute violated the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, Scalia declared, quote, the function of the court is to preserve our society's values, not revise them, to prevent backsliding from that degree of restriction the Constitution imposes upon democratic government, not to prescribe on their authority progressively higher degrees. He argued the court is not to supersede but to reflect those constant and unbroken national traditions that embodied the people's understanding of ambiguous constitutional texts. And um, uh, that uh, he saw as his, uh, his effort We've had reference made uh, several times already today to uh, Scalia's majority opinion in District of Columbia against Heller, the uh, case in which the court in a five to four decision held that the Second Amendment secures an individual right to keep and bear arms for purposes of self-defense. And uh, in a sense, it's the classic Scalia textual opinion, text and traditional opinion. First focusing on the text, he parses the words of the Second Amendment and goes word by word to uh, consult dictionaries of the era as to what bear means, what keep means, what arms mean, what well-regulated mean, what militia means, what, uh, uh, what uh, a well, what, yes, what uh, a free state means. And on that basis reaches his conclusion. Having reached that conclusion then simply on the basis of the text, uh, I think in part to preserve a five-member majority in that case, then goes on to say, and what the text says has been what the tradition, traditional understanding of that text was from its drafting and seven, uh, ratification in 1791 all the way down uh, to at least the Miller case in 1939 and, and probably really uh, closer to 1970. Um, now, I want to turn to a couple of cases where, uh, building on what, uh, what, what Jack said about Scalia on criminal procedural matters. Um, the Fourth Amendment. Um, when, when Jack talked about the uh, Jones case, Jack first mentioned the um, reasonable expectation of privacy, which was formulated for the first time by Justice Harlan in his concurrence in um, Cats Against the United States in 1967-68. Prior to that time, all Fourth Amendment cases dealt with trespass. The Olmsted case, one of the first big cases the court heard, had to deal with putting a wiretap on uh, some rum runners' uh, phone lines to see when they were bringing booze down from Canada. But they made certain that the wiretap was not inside the house, but outside 
on, on a public line where the, the, the police had, uh, uh, in this case, federal agents had a right to be. Um, uh, trespass was the traditional understanding of um, the uh, Fourth Amendment and what it was uh, protection against down to uh, the Katz decision uh, where is, uh, what a person wants to keep private, uh, uh, it can be kept private, what's in public is, 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 is public. Uh, that that uh, trespass notion was, was long and deep. Scalia continues to use what was the traditional argument uh, of the Fourth Amendment in, in the Jones case and the Jardines case uh, and in others. The one where he doesn't is the Kylo case, the thermal imaging case. In this case, the federal agents put the thermal imaging machine on the street where it didn't violate the privacy interests of Danny Kylo. Um, but they then used this thermal imaging unit to uh, sense heat radiating from inside the house, which tipped them off that there were uh, uh, halide lights growing marijuana. They then go and get a subpoena to get the uh, utility bill that uh, this house was sucking a lot of energy. Uh, they then use that as probable cause to secure, uh, uh, obtain a warrant from a, a magistrate to, to search the house. And Scalia said, no, you, you, can't, you can't do that. And again, because he doesn't want backsliding. If people want more rights, they can pass civil rights laws that give them more. But his job is to make certain rights don't mean less. And look at what he wrote. In the case of the search of the interior of houses, the prototypical and hence most commonly litigated actor area of protected privacy, there is a ready criterion with deep roots in the common law of a minimal expectation of privacy that exists and that is acknowledged to be reasonable. To withdraw protection of this minimal expectation would be to permit police technology to erode the privacy guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment. We think that obtaining by sense-enhancing technology any information regarding the interior of the home that could not otherwise have been obtained without a physical intrusion into a constitutionally protected space constitutes a search, at least as here, where the technology in question is not in general public use. This assures preservation of that degree of privacy against the government that existed when the Fourth Amendment was adopted. Um, th there is a, an, another a, a good example of backsliding, this coming from the, uh, the Sixth Amendment right to confrontation. And Scalia writes a number of wonderfully important decisions on, on the right to confrontation. The right to confront witnesses against yourself in a criminal, uh, oneself in a criminal trial. One is coy against Iowa. Coy against Iowa didn't involve high technology. Uh, it involved uh, L Iowa passing a law that allowed when uh, juvenile uh, victims of sexual assault were testifying in trial, when they took the witness stand to have a translucent screen erected uh, shielding the uh, defendant from, or the, 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 uh, the uh, witness from the defendant. Now think about the prejudicial aspect of putting a screen up suddenly when the victim testifies. But Scalia's concern wasn't with that. Scalia's concern wa was with literally what confrontation means. Confrontation had been reduced to meaning the right to uh, cross-examine. But Scalia said, no, confrontation means eye to eye. Look me in the eye and say, I did it. And that screen prevented that from happening. And he carried a majority in that case. He lost it two years later uh, in Craig against Maryland, a case dealing with the use of uh, closed circuit TV. But he dissented in that case because you can't look, uh, the, the uh, looking into a, a video camera uh, and saying the defendant did it is different from looking the defendant in the eye. And uh, Scalia will go on on other confrontation cases saying, uh, the, any statement that is used against a, a witness, uh, defendant in court must be subject to cross-examination, either prior to uh, the trial through a deposition or at trial itself. And if the person cannot testify, uh, the, the uh, prosecution bears the, the, the burden of having a diminished uh, case. That was his argument f with these young girls testifying in, in COI. If they wanted to protect those girls from the uh, second uh, victimization, the additional trauma of having to testify, the way they could protect that person, uh, th those victims, is not call them to testify. And if the prosecution couldn't make his case without their testimony, 
so be it. Scalia's argument was, I want to make certain the uh, right to confrontation doesn't mean less for that criminal defendant in Coy than it meant when it was ratified in 1791. I want to prevent backsliding. And I think you can go through, uh, obviously the time doesn't permit here, uh, uh, lots and lots of examples of Scalia uh, acting consistent with this quotation, reaching conclusions uh, that he doesn't like because he's a good judge. Thank you.